Welcome to Slammed, a Boston Celtics podcast. I'm Megan Adelini from WEI, joined by Esteban Bustillos of GBH and Justin Turpin, also of WEEI. Uh, so we are coming off of a complete beatdown that the Celtics put on the Miami Heat down in Miami. Uh, <laughs> I think we just need to start there for our big topic of the day or really big topic of the week, I should say. What can we take away from this game? Is it too strong to call this a revenge game for what the Heat did to the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals last year? Uh, what do you make of this, guys? Uh, I, so the 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 NBA scheduled this during rivalry week, and I think it's fair to say this is is this uh, these are the Celtics' biggest rivals. I would say so, just given the, the recent history between the two. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can't. I mean, I, I think that they'll always have a, a little thing with Golden State because of getting bested by them in the finals two seasons yeah. ago. But that, you know, they're in such different places in their franchises, Golden State yeah. and Boston, that it, it doesn't really feel they, they just have a weird thing with Golden State where it feels like they're trying to take the baton from them. Right. Yeah. I and mean, maybe even Philly. But yeah, this one, I think this was like this is the ideal of what this Celtics team can look like. Not just they can stretch the floor. They can go inside Tatum. Obviously, I think he had some some great shots, but also just getting to the rack. Porzingis, uh, before he went down with his his uh, ankle injury scare, this was, a, this was what I think the rest of the league was scared of when this team sort of came together. It's like, this is what they can do to anybody on a given night. So I think it's kind of cruel that they scheduled this rivalry week and then put Miami in the position that they put them in, which is like, it's not so outrageous to play, you know, on the second night of a back to back. But when you stack up what the Celtics were coming off of, which is two days rest and then going on the road, which is a pretty quick road trip down to Miami. Like, it, I don't want to take away from what was a historically efficient night offensively for the Celtics because that's very important but I will say it reminded me a little bit of the flip side of what we saw with the Celtics when they went out to Milwaukee yeah. right after that Minnesota win and it's not the same scenario because again Miami's at home uh that was like a crazy travel day for the Celtics and if you remember uh they ended up, uh, we came on like right after that game and they ended up pulling a bunch of the starters partway through right. the first half. So it's not the same, but it, it didn't feel to me like a completely fair representation of who these teams are. And a little part of that is also that, and, and we can weigh in on whether this is something the Celtics should take away from the Heat or continue doing what they're doing, which is completely in the opposite direction. I don't think it's a fair representation of who these teams are when they can see each other in the postseason, but also it's partly the heat has decided to yada yada past the regular season for yeah. the most part, at least with their stars. Yeah. I think that's always been though. Like th this has happened for the past three seasons where there will be, Oh, this is like a decent team. And then the playoffs come in and Jimmy Butler turns into somebody else and just starts you, annihilating they always ruin a contender's postseason one way or the other at least one um so i i still i don't know that I, I still take this team as a serious eastern conference finals contender i mean justin what you i i read your article last night from uh that you wrote last night on on, a, on odyssey what, what was sort of your thoughts on on what this matchup means going forward I think going forward, like you guys said, it it's not indicative of what they are in the postseason because they just play so much better in the postseason. But the Celtics had answers for everything Miami threw at them. Like that zone last year in the Eastern Conference Finals completely threw the Celtics off. They couldn't get anything going. And it kind of justified the moves that Brad Stevens and ownership made, right? Because Wick Rosebeck said it on the EI airwaves that he spent the whole second half of game seven thinking about making changes against that very Miami Heat team. He brings in Kristaps Porzingis, who just completely bust down that zone. They had no answers for him, and it all started with Porzingis. Just his ability to punish the switches, his ability to take take advantage of mismatches. It's just he gives a dimension to something they haven't had and what they, quite honestly, were lacking last season. 
I think you're totally right. Um, I, I on that point, Porzingis, he's he is a cheat code for this team, and that's why I, I feel like while we're talking about him, let's just get right to it. There was a moment where I think everybody was like initially like, oh my god, no. <laughs> When you just because the way that we watch the Porzingis injury in real time is you just see him kind of on the ground writhing a little bit and then hobbling over and going directly to the trainer to the locker room. And you're and you it was almost like when I saw the replay, it it was like, oh, okay. So he falls on somebody else's foot. He just basically turns his ankle awkwardly, and you're like, could have been so much worse for what the reaction was. And Porzingis from time to time. You know, he's got that Euro flopper in him. So there, he does have <laughs> yeah. that. But um, uh, let's just hear really quick. This is uh, Abby Chin from NBC Sports Boston. She was asking him post game about uh, what he expected that ankle to feel like going forward. We saw you standing up, moving around, smiling. How is it yeah. feeling now? Yeah, it's feeling all right. It's feeling all right. That thing's going to swell up a little bit. Uh, but uh, we'll see how it is tomorrow and, uh, and go from there. Just probably a, a day-to-day type situation. Not a, not I hope so. Day. I hope so. I think tomorrow will be clear. Uh, you know how how it is doing, especially after the flight too and all that. Um, but as of right now, I'm feeling pretty good and and, and staying positive. Yeah. So first of all, I would just ask you guys uh, if you agree, Porzingis being the cheat code of this team, and so what it felt like to you in real time to get a little taste of what we know is kind of the constant thing hanging over this team and with Porzingis, which is he's a unicorn. He's incredible. But at any moment that can turn. Yeah, I agree in when I was watching it, and I saw him go down given his reaction. I think this is probably the reaction that a lot of people has like, oh, this is absolutely terrible. Like he's gone for the season. And he was like, "Oh yeah, I could have come back if I if I want to." I, I don't know how much if that that was just you know him standing standing tall. I mean, listen, anybody who's played basketball when you land on somebody's foot, that's never a good feeling. Um, but that is the question. I mean, I, the the dimension that he has. I think we've been really talking about it this whole season. The dimension he adds, he of, of his he can go out, he can shoot from the three, from the mid range. Gets he gets to the rim. That's there's he has a skill set that very few people have at his height, his size, but he does have that injury history. And I, I guess the the question is, do you do you trust his health in a seven game series in May, in June, et cetera? That's I think that's the only like that's the only weakness that I see. I mean, and that's I mean, that's true for any team, anybody is you have to get lucky with your with health with injuries but i think if he stays healthy this is this is the team to beat in the east right now it absolutely is i i can't trust it like i just can't so i think i'm constantly looking at different ways that the celtics will be able to overcome if something happens and maybe this is just me you know being paranoid or preparing for worst case scenario um, which I don't think it was last night. I, I think like it's possible that he could be available back at home for the Clippers game. He's talking about how it's going to feel when it swells up on the plane. Like it, it's almost like he's been through some version of this so many times before that he's like, yes, I have a swankle. Um, this is how I take care of my swankle going forward based on situations in the past. I I also think that like quietly we may be, we talk about Porzingis so much that it, last night is a good reminder of how efficient on both sides of the floor Drew Holiday is. And I think, um, you know, we touch on him from time to time, but he he had a great night last night. I think he started out, he had like seven for eight or something like that. And that, that that's just incredible, definitely contributes to the efficiency of the offense overall. With Porzingis, it's just... It's kind of interesting to me that, you know, you you made this, it wasn't a one-for-one one trade because you went and got, you traded Marcus Smart in order to get him. Right. But I think about how you give up Rob Williams for Drew Holiday. And to me, Rob Williams, especially in that um, 2020, uh, 2022 year when they go to the finals, 
such a similar situation where, you know, you played him kind of hard through the end of that season. And at points he was up for conversation of defensive player of the year. And then unfortunately had, you know, his various knee injuries. And some of it is just like it. People talk about at the trade deadline, do you need to shore up the big position we've talked about? I, I think that you have some nice reserves that you could depend on a little bit. I don't think that there's anything you can really do with Porzingis unless you decide to put him on ice for the entire season, which is just insane and ridiculous and, and just unrealistic. Yeah. Just, uh, just put him like in a cryogenic sleep chamber until, uh, until April, which, uh, I wouldn't put past, you know, like, uh, like Brad Stevens or whoever, just to keep him safe. But yeah, I mean, but that's the risk, you know, it, it, it it's just, you're trying to manage risk in any sport. Um, and you, you can't, you can't control it. You just have to go out there and really just hope, that the, he he won't run into a situation where he's going to land on somebody's ankle or fall weird, but that's uh, that's basketball that happens. Uh, the, the other aspect of this uh, I wanted to ask y'all, you know, former Celtic Terry Rozier now on the Heat. Does, do you think that makes the Heat better, uh, or or how do you see that playing out going forward? So I certainly think it makes the Heat better. Um, I I loved Terry Rozier during that 2018 run uh, that he was on those teams with the Celtics, uh, that kind of weird position, or was it 2017 or 2018, the year that Kyrie was injured and they made it to the Eastern Conference? That was 2017 into 2018. 2017, yes. Okay, all right, all right, yeah. Get my years a little confused. Um, So I, I loved Terry on those teams, and I thought he had the capability to be a starting point guard. I like him in this position. I think he'll fit into that roster well. All that to say, he has not done a damn thing since he got there. It has not been an immediate fit. Um, he's right. been like three I mean, just, for just 10. two days, right? Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, so but, I don't yeah. think, again, I don't think that's indicative of what he'll be going forward, but like three for 10, three for 11, just it's rough, rough little start for him. But I think he improves. Miami for sure. Does he put them into a position where they're going to be in the Eastern Conference Finals because now they have Terry Rozier? Like, I don't, I don't think it's that big of a swing. I think if the Heat make it to the finals, it'll be because of the other times that they've made it to the finals, which is yeah. they get in, they get this momentum, they get into the playoffs, uh, they play with a head full of steam. Jimmy Butler wills them into two wins that they shouldn't have in every series that they get through. And then, you know, hopefully the Celtics, if they get there, the Celtics will be there to be a team that's just overwhelmingly talented and has a healthy Porzingis. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I guess my biggest question, I didn't re- first, I didn't realize that Terry Rozier was averaging like 22.3 a game in Charlotte this season. Uh, yeah, he, he had high. a really nice season leading yeah. up to this little new stint in Miami, which again, only two games. Like it's not. Yeah, a- right. I, I guess I am interested. I know Kyle Lowry at, is, I think, 37, but his IQ on the court, his uh, his his defensive capabilities, his sort of floor general this uh, for lack of a better term that's i guess i'm interested to see how they replace that because i think that was maybe lowry's biggest contribution beyond just what you see on on the night in not night out box score um because he he made that team better uh and I, i'm i'm interested to see how how they they can replace him going forward i don't know Ter, what, what did you think of uh, of the trade I'm with Mego. I don't know how much it really moves the needle. It certainly makes him better because he's bringing in the 20s, whatever he's averaging a career high. He's aver- also averaging a career high in assists. So he brings in a better playmaking. And at this point, Kyle Lowry's done. I mean, he really had nothing left in the tank, really fell out of the starting lineup. But I'm just not sure how much it moves the needle. Like like you said, like if they're going to get to the finals, it's because of Jimmy Butler and it's because of guys like Caleb Martin that give them that boost that bring them there. But he does make them better, especially considering they were 26th in scoring. Like that's certainly going to help bringing in his scoring abilities. But I'm just not sure how much it moves 
moves the needle. And I'm not sure if it really, if you can guarantee an Eastern Conference Finals rematch, especially when you look at teams like Milwaukee and Philly in the East, even Indiana and New York, I just don't see if Miami's better than them. Uh, before we move on to Milwaukee, because obviously <laughs> we're talking about news of the week, they made some of the craziest news maybe of the season so far. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that in take flight. But but before we go there, are you guys on the Luke Cornett hype train? <laughs> because I understand yes. that Cornett is very much the beneficiary of a hot offense, particularly last night. and that we've seen this from Cornette before, maybe not to the extent of the efficiency that he's had at this point in this season, but last year he had some, you know, interesting games and contributions. And then you get to the postseason, and it's like, there's really no place for Luke Cornette in the playoffs here. I, are you looking at Cornette? Um, and we've talked about Nemus before on this podcast. Are you looking at those guys as, enough depth at the big position that they could actually have a role later on down the line, be it at the end of the regular season when, you know, you're getting into the sports science of balancing guys minutes to getting ready for the playoffs and also getting a little bit of rest. And then also, especially in the early rounds of the playoffs. Well, he's almost certainly going to have some big playoff minutes, right? Just look, looking at, their the roster as it is right because coming off the bench the guys you would trust at the the five ish uh are horford and Cornette, right I, I i can't see any way that this team doesn't play him uh in the playoffs i mean it, it, correct me if i'm wrong but i mean i think yeah he he has to play uh in the postseason i i guess the rebuttal would be <laughs> I can think of plenty of people who would say, isn't that the reason that you need to go out and make a move at the trade deadline? Which, of course, like your trade deadline is so restricted because you're in the second apron and you have to would have to probably send a role player out, a serious role player, in order to get someone back. The question is, has Cornette shown that he he is at the level where he can play those minutes and have the right impact on a championship caliber team um, or do you need to go out and, and trade somebody else in order to fulfill that big situation? I mean, I think I think the question you could even just ask, ask would you give away Cornette for somebody else? Uh, and I, I think the answer is probably no, just given the how he's played so far, his chemistry within a team. I, I don't know. Ter, what, what do you what are your thoughts? I think he's proven perfectly capable of being a third center. I mean, if you look at this bench really in all, all throughout the season, they haven't lost you a game. In fact, they've even won you a couple games. So this bench has just proven they are capable of keeping you in games and winning games. And by the time you get to the playoffs anyway, like the rotation is going to be so shortened that even if Cornette needs to play, he's proven he's capable of it. So in my opinion, I think he's more than enough. And this bench has proven they are more than capable of being competitive and winning you games. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, like, the one thing he can't really do is uh, is shoot the way Horford can from outside, right? But he he is he's just younger than Horford, and he has a little bit more size. So if, if you know, you, again, you 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 need that sort of size. I think there's gonna be some some games where it's just like, hey, just four or five cornet minutes. Those may be really impactful, even if it's not, even if he's not playing 20 plus minutes in, in a game six, game seven. I think if you can win Cornette minutes, which he's proven he he can do, I think those can swing series, you know? Especially if those Cornette minutes give Al Horford, at times Porzingis, a break, or if you can employ them in some kind of other double big lineup, which we know. Um, Joe Missoula has been tweaking with a little bit, but let's move on to take flight because yeah. as fun as it is to discuss Celtics blowouts, Milwaukee is doing crazy, crazy stuff. Insane, yeah. <laughs> I almost swore because what is going on in Milwaukee? Like they are <laughs> lucky. They are so lucky that they are such a small market. And I understand like they have this is a giant star in Giannis. Now Dame Willard is there, another giant star. But let's just break it down. In less than a year, the 
the Bucks have gone from Mike Budenholzer to Adrian Griffin to now Doc Rivers. Reportedly, they're going to pay Doc Rivers $40 million in his contract while still paying some form of contracts with these two other coaches. The stuff that has been going on behind the scenes and in front of cameras there, obviously, when Adrian Griffin gets fired, he has a 30-13 record. Terry Stotts, like, walks out of the building because, uh, according to The Athletic, uh, Adrian Griffin's yelling at him in front of the entire team. Two weeks ago, you have Giannis sitting up in front of the press saying that they need to be coached better after a loss to the Rockets. Like, on the one hand, when you look at everything that's been the, the, the dysfunction with a team with championship aspirations, you're like, oh, this isn't that surprising. But when you look at three coaches in a year, you go, how can you call this functional? You know, how can yeah. you say that, that that this is a team that has their shit together? Yeah, yeah. This is, um, it reminded me of, you remember in Monsters, Inc., uh, when uh when when boo first shows up in the restaurants and all the monsters are freaking out and there's like the they have like a doctor or whatever on tv and he's like it is in my professional opinion that now is the time to panic that is like i i don't see this as anything but a panic move from from milwaukee you know what i mean like they again they they had the second seed they have the second seed in the east and they're only trailing i think right now by three and a half games against boston you have Giannis and dame lillard uh and, you know, I, I'm i sure we're going to see more reporting in the coming days, weeks of strife within the organization under Adrian Griffin. But this is, I mean, I, I was trying to think of times when this has worked. And I can only think of two where you switch, you switch the coach during the season and that team has won a championship. Pat Riley with the Lakers in that first season and then Ty Lue with the Cavs in 2016, which came around the same time in January. Um, but that's it. I mean, it, it, do y'all feel this was like, oh, we, this was strategic or this was like, we hit the red button. Something isn't working. Well, Ty Lue with the Cavs is a really interesting comparison because again, huge star power going up against the coach. That's for, there's two things. One, we, there's the report that, you know, that Adrian Griffin came in with this new defensive scheme that he wanted to put in and the team got like five games into the season and the veterans held an intervention being like, this does not work. <laughs> and it's like, if you're losing, if you're losing faith in your coach and you're not willing to experiment with something new five games into the season, it, you might as well just hang it up there. Like it, and to have Giannis then be seemingly so opposed to the head coach like on the one hand, I think it's the right move because they, if they're going to go anywhere, it, it wasn't going to happen with that dynamic. I just don't think you could overcome that dynamic. But at the same time, it's like, it makes you, I, I thought it was a mistake to let Budenholzer go in the first place. I'm just a really big fan of his. Yeah. And then unfortunately, it seems like they picked somebody who was the wrong, clearly the wrong fit for the team. And now that they're trying to correct that by bringing in Doc Rivers, who I, I love Doc Rivers. Um, I know that he's kind of polarizing at this point in Boston and that his he's got his uh, records of, you know, being cratered from his, you know, three to one leads in seven game series time and time again. Mm -hmm. it, it is so desperate. It is so. It, it yell it screams to me like second round exit it really does yeah i mean Terp, do you do you think i mean as bad as it seems this is a team that still has Giannis. like i said Giannis, dame lillard chris middleton there they should be good i mean do, do you think that this makes them better well the funny thing is is they are good like they're they're in second place in the east like you're 30 and 13 like it's a lose lose for Doc Rivers, I think, because like what exactly would constitute as him doing his job? Like it doesn't look like they're going to pass the Celtics. They're 30 and 13, second in the East. Like if winning the finals is your only like 
way of doing your job. It just doesn't make sense to bring him in then because the guy has already had, like Megan alluded to, the postseason struggles. It just feels like a lose-lose for him. And I'm not sure how much better it really makes them. Like taking over this team that clearly has some dysfunction if you're turning against your coach after five games and you you know you're already kind of dancing on his grave the next day after during player introductions like there's clearly some dysfunction there and then taking that over in the middle of a season it's just no easy task for Doc Rivers so I'm not sure how much better this makes them. Yeah, I've, I've always you know I've I've come to, not always I've come to realize I think the hardest thing in professional coaching is getting these athletes who are the best in the world to buy into what you're saying. Be like, hey Giannis, listen to me. I know what I'm talking about, and. I'm sure you, you know Doc Rivers. Listen, as 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 you mentioned, Megan, as polarizing as he as he may be, he's one of only 36 people who have coached a championship NBA team. You know, there's a reason that that happened. He definitely knows what he's doing. He definitely knows what he's talking about. I think the hardest thing is, can you now go through all of the ups and downs that you go through when you bring in you coach? In just a few months, he he only has really like what two months until playoffs start, give or take. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and, mean, look and, again. You and you have guys with the experience in Giannis and Middleton and Dame. Not to step on you, Esteban. Like you, you should have some built-in infrastructure. It's just you're walking into a super dysfunctional situation, and you're supposed to be the savior to this team because seemingly they're all super opposed to the head coach that was there. Yeah, yeah, and so I, I just wonder, like, will you get be able to to iron out all of the wrinkles in a relationship player, a, a coach player relationship that you need to be a, a champion? Again, as far as I know, I can think of two examples, and those were with two of the best players of all time. Not and Giannis is, uh, you know, around that conversation, but can it be replicated again? Because that's basically what you're banking on is that this team can do what the Showtime Lakers did and the 2016 Cavs did with LeBron James. That's that's a tall that's a tall thing to ask. Absolutely. All right, let's move on unless you Justin you have anything else you want to add in there. Um our next take or Justin you want to weigh in on Doc yeah, one more thing. Real quick, this dawned on me yesterday when I was looking at the All-Star thing. Uh, because Joe Missoula and his staff coached the all-star game last year, as long as the Bucks are in second place in 12 games from now at the all-star break, then Doc Rivers is going to coach the all-star game, which is Incredible. just bananas. Doc, like, does, does Doc even want to do that? I mean, <laughs> being totally serious. I feel, I feel like, like there should be a game minimum. Like this should be Nick nurse, right? He, he should be coaching. It should. Yeah. 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 But it's it goes just, to the it's second place team. So it's so funny to me because Doc is like, you know, he was, he was out of coaching for how long? I don't know. Was it even like seven yeah, months? Yeah. Yeah. End, end of the, the Sixers run to now. But yeah. Uh, is, just, it, is it? Is it just the last thing? It, are you more? Who? What are you? Are you surprised that he got a job before Bill Belichick as of this recording? <laughs> uh, no. No. I think I, Doc, for, he's, he's so well liked in the league. Yeah. And he has a reputation of being able to connect with stars, you know, so it's it doesn't surprise me. The whole the Bill Belichick conversation is dominating the rest of my life. So I, <laughs> like, I almost like don't even want to get into it. We'll move on. We, we have a great football podcast. Six rings. If you want to talk Bill Belichick, I spend most of the waking hours of my life right now thinking and talking about Bill Belichick, which is something that I thought we were supposed to get over once he left the Patriots. Um, our next point, our next take, I should say, getting back to take flight. Uh, Esteban, you threw this out there. I, I like it. I'm not yeah. sure it's like such a huge debate. There's maybe one other name in here who would take the crown here, but Kristaps Porzingis, is he the best foreign player the Celtics have ever had? Uh, of course, he had a fantastic night last night, 19 points in 21 minutes uh, before he turned that ankle. You put in these other contenders, Al Horford, Kelly Olenek, Daniel Tice, Dennis Schroeder, who I'm just completely like, I don't think yeah. those last two names are serious. I feel like it probably has to come down to uh, to to Kristaps and Al Horford there. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about it because uh, you know, watching them play against the Mavericks, uh, 
on was it Monday night? Um, and you know that that's a team, that's a franchise whose whose best player is is not American in Dirk Nowitzki, and probably the guy who the only guy who may be able to take that spot. We're watching now with Luca uh, from Slovenia. So a team that has invested heavily in foreign players. And then I was thinking about the history of the Celtics. When you think of all the big Celtics names, most are American. Uh, you know, going back, thinking even through throughout the history of the franchise, Bob Cousy, Russell, Havlicek, Bird, McHale, etc. Even going now into the the two thousands, teams of Carnett, Pierce, Rondo, Ray Allen. Uh, obviously, now to the to the modern times, Smart, Irving, Tatum, Brown. Very few foreign folks that I can think of that the Celtics have brought on. So it, it's a short list. But I think, yeah, it, it has to be Kristaps. And I know we've only he's only been here for this season, but it is interesting. I mean, what what is there any reason that y'all think that the, that that's that's happened with the Celtics, or it's that's that's just sort of how they've? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a strategy, but it's just throughout their their history for a number of reasons. I think it's it's been mostly Americans. Do you think there's any reason for that? It's so weird. I, I've actually never thought of it before that way. And I guess um, it, I was thinking about when Christoph Porzingis first got introduced with the Celtics. I was like, oh, yeah, that's like, you know, it's a different kind of interview because of the English as a second language. Yeah. And the only other time I could really think of that being, um, you know, a big thing was with Daniel Tice because he has the thick you know, accent having English as a second language. Yeah. And it, but it's true. It's like, it, it's, it's interesting when you look at where the league is right now with international players having such a huge stage in the NBA. And whether it's Giannis and Bede, Luca, um, you know, Jokic, obviously it, it's, it's great for the league because these are incredible players. But for whatever reason, like, I don't, I can't really think of a through line that comes to mind as to why it's been less so in in Boston, even yeah. from a draft perspective. It's I would have to say so far it seems to be Porzingis, but Al definitely puts himself at like a nice number two. Yeah, I mean, just can you think of anybody else who is in that conversation? No, I couldn't. And it's actually funny you thought about that. I, was, I started thinking, I was like, I can't think of any. Maybe, maybe Luigi Tome, but he wouldn't crack that list. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's interesting. But like you see the national players growing in the league as a whole now. You're starting to see them really kind of yeah. take over, like Megan just said, with Embiid, Giannis, uh, Luka, Jokic. So it is a good thing. But, I mean, it's so strange that there's really such a short list with the Celtics. Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's uh, a way to track this, but in terms of I, this, this is one of their most international rosters that I can remember. I mean, Porzingis, Horford, obviously, but uh, coming off the bench, Jose Brissett, uh, Delano Banton, we talked about uh, Nemesis Kedas a lot, um, even uh, guys like Sfi uh, from who is is Ukrainian. Yeah, a lot of a lot of international uh, representation on uh, on this Celtics roster. I, I wanted to ask y'all. Uh, because this this did get me thinking. I did look it up. What country besides the United States has produced the most NBA players? Do y'all know? Is this you have the answer in front I of you? I have the answer. I do have the. Oh answer. man, let me think. Like for some, this is not the answer. I just feel like over the last five years, Australia and Canada have been having a moment. Um, Canada, but I'm. Yeah. Canada is one. I know Canada is a big one. We went through yeah. a little bit of a French Revolution. Yeah. Um, you're putting me on the spot. No, no, it's okay. You you did say Canada is number one. Uh, Canada is number one. Yes. Uh, For, is that in the league right now or the league all time? Ever, ever. Ever. Uh, so this is that according, surprises me. Yeah, world population review, and I I sort of because uh, I would think Spain would. Spain would be kind of dominant too. According according to the site, let's see. Um, do they list Spain? They don't even list Spain. But uh, oh wow, I guess so, it's just me. <laughs> yeah, I, I I kind of I mean you know, you know guys like the, the Gasols, uh, Ricky Rubio, uh, technically Serge Ibaka who has a citizenship I think in Spain. Um, 
So Canada is number one. Uh, you know, cross reference this a little bit with with basketball reference. Uh, France, as you mentioned, has forty. What's really interesting, um, though, if you consider countries that used to exist, uh, so oh, Yugoslavia, no. <laughs> uh, which broke up, if if it was one country, uh, eighty three players. Uh, what? So obviously that includes like Serbia, Slovenia, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, so that's a lot of folks, uh, 83 and uh, one that is even, uh, that would also be a, a crazy hypothetical to think about the former Soviet union, which would include Latvia, um, yes, 54 players, 54 players would, uh, NBA players would have been, uh, of the, of the so former Soviet union. So yeah, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. What if, uh, that, that talk about a super team. Well, I'm glad that I got Canada. I still yeah. feel like, I don't know. I guess Spain just has strong representation from like the Y2K basketball. Yeah, they always do. Um, but a lot of Canadians in the league. And then you even think about like, you know, guy like Steve Nash. Uh, you got SGA. Uh, I'm trying to think who else uh, in the league right now. That's Canadian Wiggins. Uh, yeah, you, 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 they, they're out there, you know. Uh, and it makes sense, right? You know, they they have had two NBA franchises uh, in the past. They're, they're right right there next to right across the border. It makes sense. Um, our final take flight. Unless you had anything you wanted to chime in about world basketball, Terp. No, no, interesting no conversation. USSR, no. USSR, yeah. Soviet takes. I'm still <laughs> studying my maps. Yeah, <laughs> I will say I went to public school. And in seventh grade, like world studies or whatever it was, our school was so uh, in a bad place that our textbooks still had like the Soviet Union map uh, yes. in our world studies. Book. The but wonders I, of American public not, education. I am not that old. Like it was yeah. at the time I was like, it was like, yeah, we could never remember the USSR's existence, but this is in our textbooks. So yeah, your textbook was still telling you about the the red scare, the the, exactly. the the dangers of international communism. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, all right. Our final take here. Um, Embiid, obviously, with the 70 points this week. Cat with the, what was it, 62? Do I have 62 that right? 62 and a loss. 62 and a loss. And so, Esteban, you had one other great feat this week. That, and I say feat with a double entendre or pun there that you wanted to include in this trifecta of incredible moments of NBA this week. Uh, yeah, Jalen Brown snatching the soul out of Luka Doncic on the crossover and then having it replayed in the arena. My little sister yeah. was at that game. Oh, nice. She, yeah, and she was like, yeah, that definitely happens where they replayed it in the American Airlines Center in Dallas. And... Yeah, Tim Hardaway going and like yelling at the video board operators. Incredible stuff. Yeah, what a what so wait, what why are they do they hate Luca? Like what's going on? Are they are they trolling him? I, I, I just stadium? I just think they weren't thinking. They were just like, okay. Oh wow, that's a cool play. And they're like, they Oh, wait play. a second, that's the wrong, <laughs> wrong jersey. Um, yeah, what an incredible NBA week. What I this is the, the, you remember that old campaign that used to have where NBA where amazing happens? This is this yeah. is that where it's just like <laughs> you'll get a random week in January where just you'll have these like at least two or three incredible performances happening all at the same time. What what was sort of y'all's favorite uh, favorite moment uh, from from this week? No question for me, it's seventy from Embiid. Like yeah. it's just so cool. It's only the third time it's happened. Um, I, I feel like it is a little like it, it was it, the, the coolest part to me was watching Kevin Durant's reaction to it. 70? Did you guys see the post game press conference yeah. when some of the reporter asked him about, hey, did you did you hear about Embiid 70? And he's like, what? 70? And it's yeah, it's also amazing because Embiid's had huge games before, obviously, you know, MVP, but he. His last uh, highest scoring game was 59, which is really big, but like 70 is a huge jump from that. And I'm sorry it had to come at your expense, Esteban. Oh, it's okay. It was, it <laughs> but was, it's just, yeah, 
it's it's I I love Carl Anthony Towns, but doing that in a loss does have a streak of yuckiness. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a better feat from Embiid. It came in a win. Um, he's having an amazing season so far. Hopefully he stays healthy and yeah. also whatever it takes to do that. Like, don't go for the MVP again. Just <laughs> look for the postseason or maybe do if you're a Celtics fan. That's what you want. But it, it was really cool. Yeah. Kat, the funny thing about cats, I was uh I was at the gym the next morning and, and there was two guys talking about it and they're like, cat scored 62 or and, and, and beat. And I, they didn't realize that the wolves lost. And so I, I was like, I leaned over, I was like, they, yeah, they, they lost it. So, so the Hornets, you, they you lost. just butted in. Yeah. I was like, yeah, just, just to let y'all know. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Terp, what, what, what do you think? What was your favorite of uh, of this week's performances? I thought the Embiid was the most fun, but I just thought it was super interesting that Cat only played three minutes and 40 seconds in the fourth quarter of a close game in which he dropped 62 points. Like, he just didn't play in the mm. fourth quarter. It just made no sense to me. But I thought the Embiid was really interesting, especially because listening to uh, Greg Popovich pregame, and he's like, uh, it was they were hyping up the matchup with him and Wemby, and he's like, we're gonna have an answer for him, and then he dropped seventy. So I thought that was funny <laughs> yeah. too. So, yeah, uh, but there was a good week of the NBA. It was like, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, there was no yeah. answer exactly. Yeah, there, was, there was no answer when when somebody's. And it's like it puts everything like when you sit and think of just like the perspective of that a hundred point game that Wilt Chamberlain had that sort of mystical game like you drop 70 now go get 30 more you know yeah that's that's crazy that's crazy i also loved how um yeah the wolves coach was like subtweeting and beat uh, a cat after the game like you you just scored a, a career high and then you lose and then your coach is is you kind of throwing you under the bus to to the reporters that's uh definitely I, you know, that, that's a weird look that's a weird look yeah, that'd be another situation I'd keep my eye on because uh, the Timberwolves are, I I think, like maybe the second best team in the league behind the Celtics. You you'd, you could argue two, three or four there. Yeah. Uh, but they're certainly in contention and certainly a weird look. Yeah. You know, very strange overall. Um, yeah. All right. Well, guys. Unless there's anything else that you want to jump on here. I know I know we got Jason Tatum. He's an all-star again. He's like yeah. tweeting up, posting up a storm about what an honor it is. I don't think that was a shocker to anybody. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, I, 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 the last question I have, is it true that Missoula calls uh, Jalen Brown and Porzingis cookies and cream? Is, is that is that a real thing? I can't imagine it is. It's so Apparently weird. Apparently he made I up never... the nickname. Yeah. Oh, cookies doesn't and mean cream. He calls them necessarily. I mean, imagine he's like drawing up a play and we'll be like, well, this one's cookies and cream. It's like a high pick and roll. <laughs> it's I, just, <laughs> just I, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a strange one from Missoula, but if, if they like it, that's all that matters. Or if they hate it, like if you hate a nickname, then it sticks with you for life. Yeah. Yeah. I fave it. <laughs> all right. Well, that was slammed. Uh, of course, Whatever you guys are listening to us on, you can you can continue to get us here. But if you're with us on YouTube or anywhere else, you can find us wherever you get your podcast. We're on here every week discussing the Celtics and the rest of the NBA at large. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, and uh, we'll check in next week. Celtics have the Clippers at home on Saturday. We'll see how Porzingis' swankle is. <laughs>